My name is Eva Moses Kaur, for short, Eva Kaur. The museum is set up in a chronological order, and it starts out with the chronology of the Holocaust, which started in 1933 and ended in 1945. It was Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, physically and mentally handicapped people, Jehovah Witnesses, and anybody who opposed Hitler. According to Hitler, they had no right to live. So there were a total of 11 million people. Now this museum is called Candles. And Candles is an acronym for Children of Auschwitz Nazi Deadly Lab Experiment Survivors. And candles are used as a memorial, but we also wanted to illuminate this dark and hidden chapter of the Holocaust. When the architect designed the new building, he decided to incorporate the name into the design. So you can see we have 11 windows so one window for every million victims. There were 11 million innocent human beings murdered by the Nazis. I have to tell you that I was born in 1934. Hitler rose to power in 1933. So by the time I was born, my destiny was sealed, as was the destiny of all Jewish children born in Europe between the 1930s and 40s. The only luck that I had that I was born a twin. If I wouldn't have been born a twin, I would not be here to tell you my story. Because children were, the Nazis had no use for children, and they murdered them, the first one to be murdered. This is the last picture of the family, and there are a few other people here. This is a cousin, and this is a friend. The rest of it is my father, my middle sister, Elise, older sister, Edith, my twin sister, Miriam, my mother is Jaffa, and this is me. And that is the last picture of the family. From all that picture, beside my friend, Luci, only I am still alive. The rest are all, have all died. What made the Holocaust possible? Because if we want to prevent it in the future, and everybody says, never again. Well, that's a very important idea. Now, how do we go about it? In my opinion, this museum is my answer to it, never again. But even when I'm teaching it, I want people to think about it, what made it possible. There are, in my opinion, four reasons. Reason number one is a worldwide depression. Many churches and many charity organizations opened soup kitchens, and the government did start the job course, trying to put people to work. In Nazi Germany, Hitler, who rose to power, said it was all the fault of the Jews. So we have reason number two. Prejudice, unchallenged, unchecked prejudice for centuries. Everything that went wrong in the world, it was always the Jews. And uh, I believe personally that prejudice is a cancer of the soul. Whatever group is picked against, it's never justified. Reason number three was the end of World War I where many Germans felt that the world was very unfair to them, that they were blamed for World War I, and when Hitler rose to power, he said, I'm going to make you Germans proud to be Germans again. And even though they thought Hitler was a little bit crazy, but they wanted to be proud to be Germans. And I believe every human being has to be proud of who they are. Reason number four was the eugenics movement. The eugenics movement was a scientific movement that was started in the 
20s in Germany, German scientists started a research in genetics. They started using twins because genetically, twins are in many ways the same. This became an important thing for Hitler and therefore was inviting many of the scientists to join him to design the utopian society of healthy, tall, good-looking, blue-eyed blondes. Here is one of the scientists who, as children, were discovered in the different places in Europe. They would focus in on certain features, and uh, they wanted to also highlight the undesirables, which is a little crippled boy in a chair, and here is a gypsy mother with her baby. This is a poster that they designed immediately after Hitler's rise to power. Here are the undesirables, and here are the specimen of handsome, healthy-looking, blue-eyed blonde, and that is what the idea was. Can you imagine if Hitler would have succeeded? The world would be ruled by Nazis, and these blue-eyed blondes would run the world. Because what they were trying to do, eliminate anybody who didn't fit that ideal. It, it, it's mind-boggling what people were willing to, to accept. We can see with Hitler's rise to power, the Nazi flags go up on many buildings, even though the truth is that not all Germans, not all Austrians liked Hitler, we can see here the huge Olympic Stadium. And, and as you are looking at all these pictures, you see history on the wall. And then you see me as a survivor of that history on the wall telling you my story. So it's kind of an interesting little combination. But you can see that this is filled to capacity with young people. These are probably age 10, 11, 14, 15. And the way I look at that, there was a depression. There was no food at home, no jobs. Hitler wasn't stupid. From what I know, at rock concert, it's very noisy, right? And then people kind of sway to the beat of the music. Many of the people don't even know what on earth is going on. But one thing, it makes them feel good. And this is what the idea was here. That it was so upbeat that even of the, some of these young people didn't really know what Hitler was saying or what he meant to capture their attention. They felt good about going there, so they joined in. It was an interesting idea because these young people, preteen and teenagers, 1933, by 1939, they were old enough to serve in Hitler's army. And Hitler, in 1939, had the largest army in the world, and he swept through Europe. And of course, the United States did not join in, until we were attacked. Because we didn't want to interfere. The United States didn't want to interfere. So there is a lesson there that when terrorists start to terrorize, we should not wait until they develop the largest force, but maybe we should stop it when it's happening. I need to tell you a little bit about me. The village I lived in was Port in Transylvania, and in that small village there were only 100 people, 100 families. And my father was a farmer, and our small village was occupied by the Hungarians. And with that occupation, everything changed. First of all, our schools have been taken over by the Hungarian, and we went to a one-room schoolhouse. The books have been changed, the teachers have been changed, and we had a math problem. 
that said the following, if you have five Jews and you kill three, how many are left? That is the way I went to school. Can you imagine a book like that in your school? No. Your parents would go up and protest and would take all their tribe to protest and all the teachers would be upset. In the United States that couldn't happen. But in Nazi occupied Europe, that was the law of the land, so everything was possible. My father had to go every two weeks to the nearby village to present himself. If he didn't, he was going to be arrested. So our life was restricted daily. We could not travel without getting a permit. And as time went on, our lives became more and more complicated and difficult. By early 1944, two Hungarian guards came to our house and took, told us to pack food and clothing because they are taking us to a regional ghetto. You are going to go, no, you can stay where you are. I want to point out, this is a favorite poster for me. There are here two children, right? About your age, maybe a little bit older. Here is a little Jewish boy being arrested for being Jewish. And here is a little German boy. He is so proud, he's wearing Hitler's youth uniform. And as I look at these two children, I see two innocent children. Neither one of them have done anything wrong. I deduct from that a very important thing that is up to us, the grown-ups in a society, to teach children to respect one another, to care for one another, and even to love one another. I gave a lecture many, many years ago, and a young reporter came, wrote a story about me, and he wrote in it, Eva Kaur is begging for tolerance. I told him, young man, you do not know anything about me. I have never begged for anything. When I was hungry in the camp, I stole. I didn't beg for it. I took it. And tolerance, no, I demand respect. And I think every human being should be given respect. Hatred, love, respect are all taught. And in Hitler's Germany, hatred against the Jews was taught in classrooms. But we hear that sometime even today that hatred is taught. Hatred doesn't grow on a tree, and children are not born being hateful. So where, how on earth did they come up with that hate, hateful attitude? Somebody taught them. So these are the people being picked up in their homes without knowing where we would end up. And their only crime was, and you can see the faces of these people, complete bewilderment. We never knew what tomorrow would bring. These are the faces of the people in the ghettos. We see here, again, pictures of a building in Berlin that is marked with the word Jewish and also with cartoons of monstrosities. And everything was documented by the Nazis. Sheer despair. There was one of the ghettos that is very well known is a direct ghetto in Treisenstadt. The Treisenstadt ghetto was, had a special importance. When people complained to the Nazis, the Jews were being treated unfairly, they would always take them to Treisenstadt, which was a ghetto in Czechoslovakia. And there they had shops and schools. They also had very tall barbed wire fences, and people were starving to death. A little boy wrote a poem, about a 10-year-old boy wrote a poem I never saw another butterfly. 
Butterflies do not live in the ghetto. Other children wrote poems and made artwork. The children died. Their creations have survived. So this ghetto is symbolized by a toy butterfly. Here is a map of Europe. As you can see, there are 23 countries in Europe that were occupied by the Nazis, and 22 of them cooperated with Hitler. I will talk at the end about one that didn't. Our ghetto was a flimsy ghetto, small. It had a very tall, flimsy barbed wire fence, and there were no buildings, only one, the commandant's headquarters. As the head of every family was taken in for interrogation. When my father was brought back, he was brought back on a stretcher who was bleeding with marks and all his fingernails and toenails had been burned because they wanted to find out where he hid all his gold and silver. Shortly after that, we were loaded into cattle cars filled to capacity. The <clears throat> doors slid on a track there was a bar that hooked into this handle. Between each two cattle cars, there was a booth with a guard with a machine gun. And he said, anybody trying to escape, I will shoot. The train moved very fast. It only stopped for one reason, to refuel. When the train would stop, we would ask the guard by our cattle car for water, and he would always say, five gold watches and we would gather the gold watches, pass it through the little tiny barbed wire window at the top, and then we would take in a bucket of water and throw it in. Well, no matter how I held my cup out, I never got any water. I wondered why are we doing that? It seemed to me that it was an exercise in futility. I understand it today. This was our only way of getting any information. It was the end of the third day. The train stopped, we asked for water, and the guard said, Was? Was, which in German means what? I instantly understood what happened. I was 10 years old. We crossed the border into Germany, and the Hungarian guards have been changed to German and the end was near. People were praying, people were crying, everybody understood what was happening. The train moved on. It stopped maybe six or seven hours later, and we again asked for water. And this time there was no answer in any language. We realized that this must be the final stop. We were in the cattle car for a few more hours, and then the cattle car doors, as you can see up there, opened. A mass of people poured out. My mother grabbed my twin sister and me by the hand, hoping that as long as she could hold on to us, that she could protect us. Everything was moving very fast. I was on that selection platform for maybe 10 minutes. In my childish curiosity, I looked around, and I realized that my father and my two older sisters had disappeared in the crowd. I never saw them again. As we were holding on to my mother, an SS was running, yelling in German, twins. We did not volunteer any information. He, he looked at Miriam and me because we were dressed alike, we looked very much alike, and he demanded to know if we were twins. My mother asked, is it good? And the SS nodded yes, and my mother said yes. At that moment, another SS came, pulled my mother in one direction. We were pulled in the opposite direction. We were crying, she was crying. I remember looking back and seeing my mother's arms stretched out in despair, and she was pulled away. I never even got to say goodbye to her, because this was the last time we saw her. All that took no longer than 30 minutes from the time we stepped down from the cattle car. Miriam and I were standing alone, bewildered. We had no idea what would happen to us. 
we became part of a group of children, all twins. In our group, there were 13 sets of girl twins from age one to age 13. We were marched throughout the camp, and this is the way the camp looks today. It's a vast camp. You cannot finish smoking it in a day. It was built for 100,000 people. In the summer of 1944, it had as many as 150,000 people. Here is the selection platform, and here is a diagram of the camp that shows that as people were being taken away, the, here are the gas chamber two, gas chamber three, gas chamber four, and gas chamber five. And they were just disappearing. We were marched throughout the camp. We ended up in a big building. We were ordered to undress, sit naked in the company of complete strangers. We sat there for the better part of the day. Sometime late in the afternoon, our hair was cut short, and we were told to have our own hair was a privilege we were granted. Then our clothes were returned with a huge red cross painted on the back, and that was another privilege which the twins were granted. Then we lined up for registration and tattooing. When my turn came, I decided that I would not allow them to do whatever they wanted without fighting back. So when they grabbed my arm to tattoo it, I began to scream, kick, and carry on. Four people. Two SS and two women prisoners restrained me with all their strengths. While they heated a pen-like gadget, it looked like a writing pen with a metal tip. They heated it over a lamp with an open flame. When it got red hot, they dipped it into ink. And then they burned into my left arm, dot by dot. The so capital letter A dash. 7063. Well, my number doesn't look clear, but it was never clear. It hasn't faded because I was not a very cooperating victim. I kept wiggling my arm, kicking and screaming and carrying on. My twin sister Miriam said that in addition to creating a general confusion, I beat the SS who was holding my arm. Well, I don't remember biting anyone. After all, I was raised to be a nice girl. And as we know, nice girls don't bite. This is uh, inside the barracks. This is the arrival again. And then we have here a larger picture of the arrival with the three railroad tracks. This is the inside of the camp. We ended up in a barrack just like this one. Inside the barrack, it, these barracks are horse barns built for horses. No windows, only windows in the elevated part of the roof. I don't think that human beings are capable of coping after such a shock as the first day. Most of the time I felt that I was watching something that was happening to somebody else. And then I became part of that picture. As we were lying on the bottom bunk bed, I tossing and turning, I could not sleep, and I noticed something big and dark moving on the floor. And I began counting, one, two, three, four. By the time I got to five, I jumped up screaming, mice, mice. I was always scared of mice. Coming from a farm, I have often encountered them. A voice from the top bunk bed said, stupid kid, these are not mice, they are rats. And you better get used to them because they are everywhere. Well, we couldn't even try to go back to sleep, so we went to the latrine. And there on the filthy floor, there's a scattered corpses of three children. Their bodies were naked and shriveled, and their eyes were wide open. And this is when I realized that that could happen to Miriam and me also, unless I did something to prevent it. So I made a silent pledge that I would do anything within my power to make sure 
that Miriam and I shall not end up on that council trim floor. I understood as a child that things were not going very well for us. And I nagged my father to escape Romania, uh, Hungary to Romania. They kept saying, if we just don't rock the boat, everything will be OK. Parents rationalize a great deal. Children are very much in tune with the everyday environment. Parents have a tendency to dismiss all that. As they kept saying, the Nazis won't come here to the small village. We are going to somehow escape. I couldn't rationalize anything like that because I could feel what was going on. Therefore, I feel in many ways that children, particularly 8, 9, 10, and 11, are very much in tune with their environment, a lot more than the grown-ups are, because they function by instinct a lot more than the grown-ups do. I made a silent pledge that I will do anything within my power to make sure that Miriam and I shall not end up on that filthy latrine floor. I had no idea how to survive in Auschwitz. And I will tell you that anything I do in my life today, I use the same idea. I put something in my head I want to accomplish. And then I don't let go of that. And then listen to different ideas that come into my mind. Our daily routine, we got up every morning at 5 AM. Can you imagine children from age 1 to age 13 standing for roll call? But everybody had to be accounted for. After roll call, we would go back to the barrack Dr. Mengele, who was the doctor in charge of our experiment, would come in with his entourage, and he would count us. He wanted to know every morning how many guinea pigs he had. Then we would get breakfast, where there was nothing more but a cup of brownish liquid. After that, we would be taken to experiment. Three days a week, like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, alternative days, and placed naked, always naked, skin and bones. Most of the time we would be standing, sometimes we would be sitting on long benches. And they covered us with some kind of a black fluid. For hours they would measure ears, nose, shape of the face, shape of the skull, shape of the eyes. They could spend two, three hours on one nostril. Every part of my body was studied. These experiments were not dangerous, but they were very demeaning. And even in Auschwitz, they made me feel like I was nothing more but a piece of meat. And the only way that I could cope with it for six to eight hours is by blocking it out of my mind. So here are some of the pictures of the other Mangala twins that survived. And there are many sad stories here is a set of twins that I just want to point out. A little boy and a little girl, the Gutmann twins. The father was taken to Auschwitz, and in 43, that was at age five, they ended up in Auschwitz. The mother was taken away and killed, and the old, they were the only ones who survived. The biggest problem for children, because I have done a little research as I formed the organization, the children who were that young, like they were, they did not remember anything about their childhood. And there were no parents. Nobody survived to fill in the pieces. Now, the boys survived in much better condition. There was a twin in the boys' camp who acted as, he was called father twin. He intervened with Mangala to get them better food a little bit better conditions, and he was really the one person who made the better conditions. A child in this situation survives by worrying about one thing, how to survive one more day, how not to get killed, how to have enough food. So the camp mentality for a child was that everybody lived in a place like I did. Everybody was in a camp. 
And the war was a big concentration camp. There were the bad guys, the Nazis, and there were the good guys, the, the airplanes that were coming, flying overhead, and that was my whole understanding. Children live in the here and now, and the need to survive takes over every aspect of a child's life. And the ones who were older than 13 were very angry because they were aware of the world outside and were not losing that point of reference. And therefore, they kept asking, why is that done to us? Why is it happening? Why isn't somebody coming to free us? So I found that very interesting. My husband is in the older age group. He was 16, so he definitely, he was telling me, I remember D-Day, we had a little hidden radio. Don't, didn't you know where D-Day was? Everyone knows what I know about D-Day. I didn't know anything. This is my husband. Um, he's a survivor of four years in the camp. He was liberated by an American colonel, and he became their mascot uh, in uh, Magdeburg, Germany. And then when the war ended, he did not want to live anywhere else but with his liberator. And I met him in Israel in 1960 when I was a sergeant major in the Israeli army because people always ask me, why Terre Haute? In 1942, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute that did the re genetic research could not find any volunteers in Germany to participate. Mengele was injured. Mengele was one of the star students from this institute. The head of the institute was Atman van Vashur. Mengele was his star student. When Mengele got back from the Russian front after being injured, and uh, Dr. Vashur told him, well, we, our experiments, we don't have any volunteers. So he said, well, why don't I send you to Auschwitz, where all these trains arrive, and you will find twins there. And then you can do your research, continue the research. Well, once the pharmaceutical companies found out about the research, they contacted the Institute in Mengele and paid large sums of money to study germs and drugs. And this is when it became deadly. The rumor in the camp was that anyone taken to the hospital never came back. The following visit to the blood lab, they took me to a side room. They measured my fever, and I knew I was in trouble. I was taken to the hospital. In this case, the hospital was filled with people who looked more dead than alive. <clears throat> so I call it the barrack of the living dead. I was placed in a small room with two other twins who told me we don't receive here any food, nor water, nor medication, that people are brought here to die. Next morning, Dr. Mengele came in with four other doctors. He looked at my fever chart, and he, de he declared, laughing sarcastically, he said, too schwer, too young, that's why I walk to labor, which means She's too bad, she's so young, she has only two weeks to live. I refused to accept his verdict. I actually refused to die. I knew I was very ill, but I made a second silent pledge that I would do anything within my power to prove Dr. Mengele wrong, to survive, and to be reunited with my sister. For the following two weeks, I only have Two memories. I remember the doctors coming in and looking at the fever chart. That's all they were interested in. And I remember often waking up on the barrack floor. It was a rough barrack floor, very dirty, crawling because I no longer could walk, and crawling because I found out that there was a faucet with water at the other end of the barrack. As I was crawling, I fade in and out of consciousness. And I kept telling myself, I must survive. I must survive. 
After two weeks, my fever broke and I immediately felt a lot stronger. I had to devise a plan that showed a gradual improvement in my condition. Actually, what I did when the so-called nurse would come and place a thermometer under my armpit and then she would leave, I would take it out if it was too high, I shake it down, put it back in and let it stick out on the other side. So when she would come, she would take out the thermometer and she would read the fever I wanted her to read. It took me another three weeks before the fever chart showed normal and I was released and reunited with my sister. The happiness of our reunion was short-lived. Miriam looked very sick. Now when I asked her what happened, she said, I cannot talk about it. I will not talk about it. I did not find out what happened to Miriam until 1985. Miriam and I never ever talked about it. Children who survive life and death experiences cannot talk about it until they feel physically safe and until they feel emotionally strong enough that they can cope with it. And that didn't happen to us until 1985. I asked Miriam, what happened to you while I was in the hospital? And she told me that for the first two weeks after I was taken away, that she was kept in isolation 24 hours a day. And under surveillance, doctors kept monitoring her. They were waiting for something to happen. And she said, I don't know what. They didn't tell me. And I don't know if it happened or it didn't happen. Would I have died? Miriam would have been rushed to Mengele's lab, killed with an injection to the heart, and then Mengele would have done the comparative autopsy. But I didn't die. So Mengele took Miriam back to the lab, injected her with something that stopped the growth of her kidneys. So her kidneys never grew from the size of a 10-year-old child. And as she grew up, got married, was expecting her first baby, she developed severe kidney problems. And by 1987, her kidneys failed completely. My sister needed a kidney, and I told her that I would undergo all the tests needed for it being a donor, and then fly to Israel and donate my kidney. And I found out to be amazing that my kidneys functioned at 90% capacity, which was very good for my age. And so in November 1987, I donated my left kidney. We were a perfect match. Her, the kidney worked perfectly, but a year later she developed cancerous polyps. And she died June 6, 1993. As uh, I understand it, she was injected with something that stopped the growth of her kidney, and so, and she was not the only one. Otto Klein, whose twin brother, also died from kidney problems. And uh, here is a twin whose twin brother was castrated, and he died in Auschwitz. We do not really know the scope of the experiments, and that is another issue, but we are just, we just have bits and pieces from what I know from my sister and what I know from my personal experience. In my childish mind, the whole world was a big concentration camp. We walked over dead bodies. Dying was so easy in Auschwitz, it's unbelievable. Survival was a full-time job. As the summer, was turning into late summer and fall. Those air raids, the yellow smoke circle, then the airplanes would come and bomb outside that yellow smoke circle. They were bombing the Nazi headquarters and the industrial factories outside the yellow smoke circle. That was my understanding, that the Nazis were losing the war. And 
whoever the Americans who were coming in these airplanes were winning. By November of 1945, the airplane rates were increasing to two to three a day. That was a very good sign to us, because that was my whole understanding of the war. We were all in camp, there were the bad guys, the Nazis, the good guys, the Americans who were coming to free us. One day we woke up to realize that we missed Tronco. When we went outside, we discovered with delight that all the Nazis were gone, that we were on our own. We cut the barbed wires. We went to organize food, water, and blankets. We were on our own, I would say, two to, to maybe two weeks, 10 days to two weeks. This is a liberation picture taken one day after liberation. We were liberated on January 19, January 27, 1945. We were free. We were alive. We have thrived over unbelievable evil. It was a wonderful day to realize that we have thrived over, over all that. I also thought, again, my childish idea that once we were free, that all my problems would be over. It's very naive, but of course, life was never again the same. There were people in all these countries who were silent heroes or unsung heroes who did not cooperate with the Nazis. And in, uh, the, among the Jews, they are called righteous Gentiles. Here are just a sample of some of these people. Here is Leif Gies, who helped Anne Frank's family hide for two years. Here is a woman who is still living in Warsaw, Poland. She's 92 years old. Her name is Irena Sandler. She was a young healthcare worker in the Warsaw ghetto. They asked her to smuggle out Jewish children from the ghetto. She smuggled out one by one 2,500 children, found for each child a Christian family to raise them at the risk of being killed if they were discovered. In addition to that, she wrote the name of each child the real name and then the adopting family names and put it in a jar. After the war, she found the jar. She buried it under a tree and contacted all those children and gave them their real identities. Oscar Schindler wanted to become rich on the war and was uh, trying to benefit from it, make gold. And once he discovered that Jews were being really murdered, he used all the money he made to try to save human lives. He saved, I think, 2,000 people. And he is also a righteous Gentile. I am, what I like about it is that these people did not go with the flow. They saw something wrong and they used their mind and their whatever physical and mental abilities they had and financial abilities to stop it. Here is Sugihara. Sugihara, Senpo Sugihara and his wife, he was a diplomat in Vilna and they he handed out 6,000 passports to Jews who kept asking if they wanted to go to Japan. The Japanese government found out about it. They recalled him and put him in jail. But those Jews survived. Raoul Wallenberg was a diplomat in Budapest. He went up to the railroad station. He went up to someone and said, oh, here's your passport, here is your passport, here is yours, here is yours. And he handed out passports to people on the cattle car, taking them off. He said, you forgot your passport, come on, let's go. And the guards were there with their machine guns, and they couldn't do anything to him because he had diplomatic immunity. He took them back to the embassy, 
and found safe places for them. And then the most interesting example is Denmark. When Denmark was occupied by the Nazis, the king was given the order that from tomorrow on, all the Jews in Denmark will have to wear the yellow star of David. When the king went on the air and said, from tomorrow on, all the Jews in Denmark will have to wear the yellow star of David. And he added, from tomorrow on, all the people in Denmark are Jewish, and I will be the first one to wear the yellow star of David. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. He didn't even disobey the law. He interpreted it differently. All the Jews of Denmark survived. Of course, the Nazis couldn't arrest all the people. Hatred and prejudice. 61 years after the end of World War II, hatred and prejudice is still with us. We had a museum here that burned by bad people in 2003. So we kept just uh, some memorial to that museum just to show people that that happened, okay? So this was firebomb? Firebomb, right, in 2003. This is a new museum that we have built since then. If you realize that everything we do in our lives, it is like a ripple in the lake. It touches the lives of many people and it has far-reaching effect. So all any of us has to worry about is that we treat our fellow human beings with respect and fairness, and we judge them on their actions and content of their character, and we are ready or making a difference in the world. I have healed myself by forgiving everybody, including the Nazis. No, I did not set out to do that, even though some of the reports at times indicate that I thought about it for years. No, I didn't think about it at all. I stumbled on it. Miriam died on June 6, 1993. So I immediately called Israel, and I told my brother-in-law that I was going to catch the first airplane I could find to go to Israel but that I desperately wanted to touch her, give her a kiss on the forehead, and say to her my personal goodbye. I have never ever buried any member of my family, and I felt that um, I should be given that little human privilege that most people get. But my brother-in-law said, don't bother, the funeral is in 10 hours, and we will not wait for you. Because of a Jewish law for religious Jews, uh, very religious Jews, that they had to bury the body within 24 hours. So I developed nightmares, and I was trying to cope with all the pain that was handed me again. And I remember that the last project that Miriam and I worked on in it was in 1992. We did a documentary. This is one of the pictures from the documentary. In Auschwitz, with 38 other survivors of Mengele's experiment. And in this documentary, by the way, it was taken in the same place, exactly, where the liberation picture was taken in 1945, and that was taken in 1992. In that documentary, there was a Nazi doctor from Auschwitz by the name of Hans Munch. He was a friend of Joseph Mengele's. He was not involved in our experiments because I have never seen him. But I figured that he might be still alive. So I wrote a letter next day, emailed, not emailed, we didn't have email, faxed it to Germany and asked them if they could please give me Dr. Munch's telephone number in the memory of Miriam. Now the reason I asked in the memory of Miriam because I have already asked for it in 1992 and they refused to give it to me. 
An hour later, I received a very long sympathy letter and Dr. Munch's telephone number. July of 1993, I am heading to Germany to meet an Nazi doctor. You have no idea how scared I was. I was very worried that I was going to be treated like I was treated in the camp, which was like I was treated like a nothing, and I couldn't deal with that anymore. Yet, I was very curious what I might learn about our experiment, and I was very curious why was this Nazi doctor willing to meet with me? We arrived at his house, and he treated me with the utmost respect. As we sat down, I said to him, Dr. Munch, here you are, a Nazi doctor from Auschwitz, and here I am, a survivor of Auschwitz, and I like you, and that is very strange to me, and it was. We talked about many things. Unfortunately, he did not know a single thing about our experiment. He said Mengele could not talk about it. His experiments were top secret, and he never discussed them. He definitely knew a lot about Nazi medicine in Auschwitz, and he talked about that. The revisionists say, and they said then, and they are saying today, that there were never any gas chambers in Auschwitz. I thought all alone to get the documentation and opinion of an SS would be very important. So I said to him, Dr. Munch, by any chance, do you know anything about the gas chambers in Auschwitz? And his response was, in English, this is my problem. This is a nightmare that I live with every single day of my life, and went on describing the operation of the gas chamber. I said to him, this was extremely important information that I wanted him to come with me to Auschwitz in 1995 to sign a document at the ruins of the gas chamber in the, witness, in the company of witnesses so nobody could ever say that he didn't sign it. And so he said, I would love to. I did not know it was going to be that easy. And so we arrived in Auschwitz I was, uh, here's Dr. Munch in Auschwitz, his granddaughter, his son, his daughter, my daughter, my son. I came back to Terre Haute, Indiana, so excited that I will have an original document about the operation of the gas chamber, signed by a Nazi. And I kept thinking to myself, what can I give this Nazi doctor? After 10 months of tossing that idea in my head, the answer came back to me, how about a simple letter of forgiveness from me to him? I immediately knew that he would like it. But I also realized something a lot more important, that I, the little victim of almost 50 years, and we really have to understand what a victim feels like. All victims feel hurt, angry, hopeless, helpless, and powerless. And that's the way I felt for 50 years. And all of a sudden, I discovered that I had powers I didn't know. That I had the power to forgive. No one could give me that power, and no one could take it away. It was all mine to use as I pleased. Wow! It was a tremendous discovery. So I began writing my little letter. I decided to call my former English professor at ISU and see if she was willing to correct my mistakes. And she did. We met a few times, and then she one day said to me, so, Eva, you are forgiving Dr. Munch, isn't that nice? I said, yes. And she said, how about Dr. Mengel? I said, no, 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 no. This is just a little letter from me to Dr. Munch. She said, think about it. And I said to myself, if I forgive the God of Auschwitz, the angel of death of Auschwitz, 
I might as well forgive everybody. Once I cleared the slate, I didn't have to worry about who did what to me and why. And so Dr. Munch signed his document. I read mine and signed it. And I immediately felt that a burden of pain was lifted from my shoulder, that I was no longer a victim of Auschwitz, that I was no longer a prisoner of my tragic past, that I was finally free. The day I forgave the Nazis, quietly I forgave my parents, whom I hated all my life. And why did I hate my parents? Children expect their parents to protect them. Mine did not protect me, could not protect me. I would often, as I was growing up, I would often say if my parents would have protected me from a destiny in Auschwitz, if my parents would have protected me from a destiny of growing up as an orphan, my life would have been much better, and I was right about that. But I finally understood that my parents did the best that they could. And so I forgave them, and I forgave myself for hating my parents. So I tell everybody, forgive your worst enemy. Forgive everybody who has ever hurt you. Forgiveness is nothing more and nothing less but an act of self-healing an act of self-empowerment, an act of taking back your life and control over your life. I have learned important lessons from my life. Lesson number one, never ever give up. And some of you might identify with that. No matter how difficult your life is, it couldn't be quite as difficult as mine was. I didn't give up, you cannot give up.